Happy New Year, everyone. It's, uh, it's about time, I'm sure we all feel. So um, we made it. And it's, uh, it really is going to be a better year. So um, we're all looking forward to it. And uh, want to just thank everyone who um, were loyal supporters to Archaeology Southwest this year. Um, we all were adjusting to, you know, very changed and difficult times. And um, I think for us as an organization, um, we adjusted quickly and, and uh, are uh, really appreciative of the way that um, all of you folks um, stuck with us and um, supported us. And we're, we're ready to give our all to 2021. So uh, onward with tonight's show. Um, this is the fourth of our uh, 20, of our uh, 14th annual archaeology cafe uh, seasons and uh, we're all digital still this year um, maybe next fall we'll be able to switch back to the in-person opportunity but uh, all all virtual for now and tonight Linda Pierce uh, John Welch and I are here in our Tucson office uh, downtown Tucson the <clears throat> traditional lands of the Tan Autumn Nation and tonight, I, every night that we have these cafes, try to remind people to think about the traditional lands of uh, the native peoples that um, they live on and in. Um, and it's particularly, I think, important tonight where we're gonna be talking about efforts to protect lands that are um, the traditional lands of, of a diverse set of native peoples across the Southwest. So, um, just a couple of quick logistics. Uh, our deep um, thanks and gratitude to the Smith Living Trust, uh, who are supporters of this, this program and allow us to um, offer it at no cost to all of our, our audience. So thank you, uh, our dear Smith family, um, who have been long-term supporters. So John Welch, um, this landscape and site protection program that John leads um, is a really, really important element of, of Archaeology Southwest and our preservation archaeology program. And we're really happy to share it with you tonight. Um, John joined us in, on February 12th of 2018. Um, he has a PhD from the University of Arizona from way back in 1996, um, which, and uh, He's going to focus tonight on protected places, Archaeology Southwest's conservation properties, and their emerging, emer, emerging roles in preservation archaeology. So I'll let John take it from here. And uh, Linda and I will uh, be back at the end. Linda will um, take your questions and, and uh, see if she can stump John um, or otherwise. And uh, we'll be back at the end to. Uh, have a little bit of a uh, talk about what's next. So John, it's all your show. Yes, indeed. Happy New Year and, and, and really just blessings all around. Wanted to start off with that and how fortunate I feel to have such great colleagues here at Archaeology Southwest and elsewhere. And so fortunate to have such a great audience of members and people interested in the conservation and preservation of Southwest archaeology in general. Um, and just so fortunate to have this great work that is really ever since I was the, um, you know, sort of discovered the idea of what it was and the, the satisfaction that comes from um, taking care of land and places important to people in the past and in the present and hopefully in the future. Uh, it's just been a you know great source of comfort and satisfaction to me throughout my career, uh, since I you know was the THBO and archaeologist for the White Mountain Apache Tribe in the in the 90s and through must much of the 2000s. So uh, you know being able to continue that work here and uh, uh, in such good company and with such good colleagues and partners and supporters, including all of you. Um, you know, just is, is, is a wonderful thing. 
Um, and, you know, the work I do here is directly related to the overall mission for, Pres for Archaeology Southwest. And I really head up um, a good part, but by no means all of the site preser protection element of the, the preservation archaeology mission of Archaeology Southwest. The mission for the cafes for this season really are to sort of pull back the curtain and see what's really going on behind the scenes at Archaeology Southwest, see what it is that we're doing, and, and at least as importantly, how uh, we do it, and uh, maybe even most importantly, why we do it in particular ways. So, uh, you know, with apologies for this sort of wordy bit here, the mission for this landscape and site preservation program that, as Bill said, I head, is to lead collaborations to provide stewardship for diverse values embedded in archaeological sites and associated landscapes. And that means uh, close cooperation with tribes and with multiple other colleagues and partners, including, you know, folks like, um, you know, Paul here at Archaeology Southwest and Aaron uh, with Stacy uh, that you, you will hear from next month in the cafe and with Shannon, uh, who provided last uh, last month's cafe. So what about this this LSPSB, the, the Landscape and Site Preservation Program? Uh, what is it that we do? How do we do it? And what's the scope that we're going to talk about for this afternoon, this evening? Um, uh, we're going to talk about the four functions of the site uh, and landscape preservation program. Uh, a little bit about history, very little bit about history. And I'm going to take you on a bit of a tour of our preserves, the 22 places that we have specific responsibilities for and, and duties to protect and take care of. Uh, and then uh, hopefully open it up with questions for you all. And you can then return the favor with questions for me. So that's the, pl the plan overall for what we're gonna do. And uh, as always, inviting your, your comments and, and, and critical reviews all the way through. So here's our four sort of parts of the LSPP um, and how I really spend my time on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Um, I provide support for the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs Archaeology Southwest ARP initiative that Stacy uh, Ryan heads, and again, you'll hear about next month. I uh, spent time um, working to expand and deploy the priority preservation lands data uh, in pro pro proactive planning. And that means a bundle of digital assets and information that, were that was collected uh, by a, a lot of different people, but in a, an initiative led by Andy Lorenzi, my predecessor here, uh, in order to have information on a regional landscape level that's available for use in uh, influencing and providing guidance to federal agencies principally, uh, but especially, you know, counties and, and state government as well as, as well as federal government agencies. Um, the third thing though, is to watch those agencies carefully and uh, challenge them to uphold the preservation aspects of their mission, to do as little harm to archaeological values and resources and landscape level values and resources that, that, that come to us out of the past uh, as they are discharging the other parts of their mission. Uh, and then the fourth one, and uh, the thing that'll be the focus for, for most of the rest of the evening's comments, is to lead the stewardship of and for Archaeology Southwest 22 preserves. Those are the, the functions of Archaeology Southwest, just a bit, a very little bit about the history of it and how we ended up coming to this idea of values-driven preservation work uh, with the six values is one way of thinking about the values that we, that we try to take care of uh, in, in, in and through our landscape and site preservation program. Um, so the first point about the history is that, that doing this in an extra governmental context has a long and multicultural history. Lots of other places and, and organizations have discovered the need to intervene where government fails and take over and do conservation work. Um, very important. So 
you know, most of the, the next few points are intended to really emphasize the distinctive aspects of what Archaeology Southwest does, because it is uh, very close to being a unique organization in the range of activities that, that we engage in and the range of partnerships that we explore and, and, and make use of. Um, most US-based organizations really focus on only one or two of these values. Um, Archaeology Southwest, though, has evolved through the years and through guidance from Bill and participation and good work with Andy and Paul and Aaron and others uh, through the recognition that there's more than just research and scientific values embedded in archeological sites, that they sit in landscapes, that these are connected to ecosystems, connected deeply into native people's historical and cultural traditions, that they provide innumerable lessons that can be used in education and outreach um, that these are assets for on economic levels, for tourism and other ways of branding places, and that they create um, deep and abiding and really important senses of place and regional awareness and belongingness and identity that are utterly invaluable. Um, Archaeology Southwest is one of thousands of land trusts that exists in, in um, uh, you know, North America, north of Mexico. Um, with millions and millions of acres, uh, 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 amount of land in private conservation now, you know, much larger than the state of Washington. Um, Archaeology Southwest, though, is just one of a few that is committed to minimizing research impacts on archaeological sites and landscapes and optimizing the diverse values while engaging with tribes to cultivate those values. So. I'm asking you now to keep an eye out for these values and think about these goals and this idea of values-driven stewardship um, with, as we do a little tour of the properties and asking you also to think about this theory that I have in the middle there, um, a proposal, if you wanna call it that, that stewardship of these diverse values boosts prospects for serving diverse audiences and clienteles for attracting diverse partners and for achieving long-term preservation goals. That it makes good sense on practical levels as well as just on um, you know, this theoretical level for us to, um, to do it this way, to look at all these different values and embrace them and seek to, to cultivate and preserve them. Okay, let's take this tour. Here we go. Obviously, Arizona and New Mexico. And our properties extend all the way from west of Gila Bend over here up all the way to Santa Fe, which is slightly obscured by my Zoom window. So let's start off locally in Tucson and kind of most simply with one of the smaller of our preserves. This includes both our conservation easements and the properties that we own in fee title ownership. And this is the little park at Vista del Rio. And so there's the um, sign that welcomes you to the park up there and uh, the way that the park looks for those of you who haven't had a chance to see it. So let's go from there to much larger, far more complex set of sites located to the west, going almost all the way out to fabulous Dateland and a really wonderful property um, that Archaeology Southwest, courtesy again of the, the Smith family, is privileged to uh, own and provide stewardship for uh, a wonderful integrated landscape of petroglyphs and uh, cleared areas used for thousands of years uh, associated with a volcanic feature on the landscape along the Gila River. And from there, just back over across the true Gila Bend that we see there briefly and to the area just to the south of Gillespie Dam, 
uh, the property that we sometimes refer to as the Gillespie Narrows, another volcanic feature, uh, the edge of a volcanic bluff, a lava flow, uh, helping to define the, the floodplain. Incredibly beautifully populated and decorated with these glyphs. Hundreds of them in close association with a ball court feature and numerous other um, residential and land use elements that define a very, very special place that again, we're privileged to own uh, in part because of the generosity of the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. And then sort of in some ways, where the landscape and site preservation program began over in the San Pedro River Valley and working um, upstream uh, from the, the, the Bingham property. This is a, a, a terrific um, upland area populated with a bunch of rock features as well as living heritage in the form of, uh, of agaves. Um, this property made possible with hard work from one of the early uh, champions of preservation archaeology, uh, Jackie Dale. So working upstream on the San Pedro, going south from there to have a peek at one of the signature archaeology southwest properties, the Reddington Ball Court. Everybody, I'm guessing, has probably seen these, photogra these photographs, and many of you will have experienced this, uh, again, very, very special place in the San Pedro, eight acres owned by Archaeology Southwest. So many details that make it possible to go have acquired these places, and there's so much more that could be said about each one of them. Um, Daniel Baker made possible this conservation easement. They're preserving part of a, of a subipery site and another part of a, of a rich landscape there just a little bit farther upstream. And then Harold Elliott and his wife made possible um, the acquisition of this, this large parcel, just not far at all from, from the Baker property um, that has a significant um, site located in this area that has been tested and archeologically evaluated by Patrick Lyons and others. The, the house property is cut out from the, um, the ownership to allow uh, the archaeology southwest ownership to allow continuing uh, residential use of that property. And then in a certain sense, the uh, uh, sort of pinnacle of collaboration there because this is a property at Baikat Khan, uh, a, uh, the village of Sobipuri village site co-owned with uh, excellent partners at the Cascabel Conservation Association. I say this is where in some sense where it all began because it's the research that, that Bill and Jeff Clark and other folks did that, that brought forward the incredible values of these places and established the foundations for the relationships that made it possible to acquire the conservation easements and, and the, the fee simple properties. So then this is a couple of, uh, which we cite, not exactly isolated places, but um, uh, not exactly orphans, but out of the San Pedro Valley and farther to the southeast of, uh, of, of Arizona. This is a, a um, uh, uh, San Simone phase archaic site on the edge of White River Draw, a double adobe property that also includes some historic features. Another continuing theme in our, in our uh, uh, understanding of these places is the, uh, the persistent idea that 
that uh, once some place is a good place for humans to hang out is kind of always a good place. There's almost always residential features very closely, closely associated with these properties, as you can see. Here's another sort of conservation easement cutout um, where uh, at the Murphy property that allows the, the, the owners to continue to reside there while the property is, is, is protected into perpetuity for um, its archeological values. This is uh, a property that was also investigated for um, uh, sales and, and, and Howery investigated it for its archaic, late archaic stage um, um, archeological values. And then it was revisited uh, in the last few years by Jonathan Mabry and Jesse Ballinger um, and did some additional um, research there to, to recover additional information and um, helped refine and build the relationship with the, with the owners that made possible, again, its, its long-term protection. The Membrace Valley, uh, important also in the evolution of our preservation program because of the acquisition from the Membrace Foundation of their um, real estate assets uh, there along the Membrace River in, in southwestern New Mexico. So we start here with uh, the, the, the conservation easement that we hold on a one small part of a Membrace uh, pit house village associated with the, a, a nature conservancy. The nature conservancy owns this preserve and has asked us to assist them by conserving the, the uh, archaeological values and, and, and making sure to provide that extra layer of protection uh, for them. This is what the site looks like. Beautiful part of the world, lovely little parcel. And then just, just down the road, not far from there, is a small Salado room block with great neighbors who keep an eye on the place for us and also help us sometime by removing some of the dead wood and good for fire protection for our property and good for them for heating their homes at this time of year. That's what the place looks like. And then a property that many of you will be familiar with at the, the Membrace Cultural Heritage site, the Matex uh, site that is actually shown as a single property, but it's a couple of different conservation easements. The one on the on the the, the left is uh, uh, is neighbored by uh, Jesse Ochoa and his wife, and the the Membrace Cultural Heritage Site organization takes care of the conservation easement, owns the land under the conservation easement on the right part of it. So. It's well known to many folks who have been associated with Archaeology Southwest because of lots of field trips there. Lovely place to be, especially in a hot Tucson summer. And it's, it's uh, also unique in that there is uh, an active managed interpretive program there and a small museum that's very, very good. So well worth a visit if you haven't been, for sure. And then just over the hill from there is another conservation easement um, provided by Linda Pafford uh, on the McNally site, uh, a site excavated, I believe in the, in the late 70s or early 80s, um, and uh, partially excavated, I should say, by the Members Foundation and um, set aside then for preservation um, in, uh, in, in contrast to, and, and you know, having this upland site, uh, pit house site also taken care of and, and protected um, as a complement to the, 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 the river-based sites along the Membrace River and some of its tributaries, including this one, the other um, property that we own in the neighborhood at uh, the Wheaton Smith property. And so here it is along the Membrace River tributary, um, beautifully set. And another place where the 
um, early occupants um, were succeeded by historic period ranchers who made use of the river cobbles lying around there in order to create them, create their homestead as well. So continuing sense of, of importance of the place and another place with immediate access to, um, you know, a sense of landscape features with trails, the water courses, um, numerous other indications of long-term and continuing values. And then um, another sort of small property, a conservation easement in the little village, the south part of the little village of La Cienega, very close to Santa Fe, uh, with a uh, conservation easement that we hold on property owned by the Archaeological Conservancy. Again, important to provide multiple layers of protection uh, for these sites and right adjacent to a, another very formidable and, and, and worthy of visiting uh, petroglyph site. Just across the creek there. That's what it looks like, some artifacts there. Otherwise, it's really best described as, as, as just a pile of melting adobe features and unfortunately has also had a couple of, of, of uh, wildfires through it in recent years that have not helped uh, its erosion problems. So we're continuing to monitor that fairly closely. And then from there, coming back ever so slightly to the, to the east, just to round out um, the, the presentation of the two other sites that we hold up in the, the, the Rema area. Um, this Spear 142 is about 150 room uh, Pueblo from the mid 1300s, familiar to many of you who have seen piles of masonry before and associated artifacts, but in a particularly beautiful area. And then just to the west in the area associated with Los Gigantes, the Davis Ranch property, 100 acres that uh, protect the remnants of a post Chaco and Great House community there provided in a partial donation and purchase from the, the Davis family. So that's our properties in, in a very quick and hopefully not too uh, motion sickness inducing presentation to give you a sense of the range of properties that are out there, the range of values associated with those properties, and the range of issues that we face in um, providing the long-term protection of the properties. This is where we left off and where I'll resume just with a brief discussion about sort of what it all means and what we're doing with and for this. You know, the point is, is um, not really all that simple in a way that this is actually a pretty difficult enterprise to provide for the long-term conservation of properties held in private hands. It's something that requires a continuous strategic evaluation of the costs of investing in preservation as opposed to the confidence that your investments are going to have long-term sustainable benefits. And so it's very low cost to um, just bug the government about stuff in some ways, but there's almost no certainty associated with the outcomes of it. You know, it's also fairly low cost in order to, you know, solicit and sometimes uh, get for free conservation easements to hold the properties. But as you can see, the costs can be quite high if you're obliged to enforce those conservation easements and make good on your pledge as the holder of a conservation easement to um, defend it. Um, we haven't engaged in conservation leasing, but it's an, another potential higher uh, cost um, activity with also not a lot of certainty associated with slightly less certainty, I should say, because those are always timed out. They, they are conservation easements basically held for shorter periods of time. Um, the priority preservation lands initiatives pre-identifying 
on a proactive basis the values of archaeological sites is a slightly higher cost um, effort, but again, depends on goodwill and careful planning and attendance to preservation missions by, by, by governments, uh, whether they be cities, counties, states, or federal governments. Um, the highest certainty option is to acquire all of the property rights in fee simple ownership there, but it comes dear. Uh, and we, I've asked, also offered a few other options for strategic consideration, you know, participation in group litigation, jumping in on lawsuits in order to oblige federal agencies and others to make good on their, uh, on their preservation stuff, on their preservation mission, and solo litigation as the highest cost, but also very uncertain um, uh, option for, for preservation activities. So here in a way is, um, you know, if that's a summation of where we are and the strategic options that you have in order to provide it, uh, provide for preservation of places. Um, I, I thought I would close with uh, uh, an invitation for you to, of course, ask questions that have come up, but also just to pose some questions for you all. As you can see, this 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 the 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 wheel of the archaeology southwest motion grinding through here, conducting heritage protection and outreach and research and doing tribal engagement on all of those things, all the while building relationships and protecting places. Um, but what does this mean? What is it that we should do in order to grasp and leverage? They're truly momentous environmental changes currently underway. And by environment, I mean very broadly, the biophysical environment, sociocultural environment, and political environment in our world, I would submit to all of you, is changing swiftly and we have to be prepared. We have to find ways to navigate through and come up with ways to position ourselves to be able to discharge our preservation mission and take care of our properties and make good on our overall uh, obligation to do preservation archeology. span what should we do to harness and enhance the values embedded in our places um, and in our programs and in our history of success? How do we continue to build on what we've done and not slow down and be able to at least maintain ground and expand on and use our properties and our, our other assets strategically in order to do our, our important work with all of your help? Um, and then another question here is how and what should we do to serve and grow our clientele? How do we make sure that all the entities that uh, groups, organizations, individuals who share those values uh, in, in place and in landscape uh, receive benefits from our work and have a chance to contribute? Um, what should we do to integrate and deploy our unique and potent asset portfolio? And what should we do to improve how we prioritize and sequence our investments and our interventions. So last but not least, always the question, what should we learn from and about what we don't know, what we haven't anticipated, what our environmental scans have not detected. And so I leave you with that as an opportunity for you to tell us about it and what, what the answers to those questions. Oh, I was trying to go backwards and I flubbed it, sorry. That's it for me. I am ready to get the answers and, if possible, provide um, questions. Uh, well, good, because um, we have some questions for you. So, although I don't know if Shannon's there, I don't, so I haven't seen a question from her yet, John. So you should be okay. So, all right. Um, so yeah, I've seen some people raising their hands, but we, we really aren't functioning that way. So if you want to ask a question, just type it in the Q&A and um, we will either try to throw it at John tonight to answer. If we don't get to all of your questions, um, we'll ask him to try to address them in writing to be put on our website um, later on. So uh, one of the earlier questions was, um, could you tell us how does Camp Naco fit in with the Archaeology Southwest um, LSPP. This is an easy one. I don't know. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm afraid I have never been to Camp Naco, 
And uh, while I have seen a couple of uh, old email folders and so forth about Camp Naco, yep. I am uncertain about that. Well, so Linda or Bill to, to chime in. We could call Bill in. He could probably address that briefly. Yeah. Pop in real briefly here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Camp Naco is a it's a turn of uh, right after World War One, a military encampment, uh, literally about 700 yards from the international border down at Naco, Arizona, and the 24 buildings that were built there. Uh, when we started working with a partnership of local people down there in 2004, were threatened by demolition. So we've been a partner uh, down there. It's, it's not a direct part of our program, but we're helping uh, folks down there raise funds and uh, promote the place. And uh, we've been uh, long-term partners down there. The, we've, got, we've responded to issues related to arson and just um, the erosion of adobe buildings and and partial restoration but it's an ongoing project and we'll we'll answer this in in greater detail on the um, written responses um, next week but a uh, good question and it's an important place but it's really not um, something that john has been that directly involved in so i had to appear out of nowhere to <laughs> provide a well, short answer I promised him at least one tough question, so that could have been it now. Okay. So Not just tough one, complete stump. <laughs> All right. So, um, um, how do we monitor lands that do not have a local resident? Uh, we visit them uh, either directly. I go there. Another member of the staff goes there mm -hmm. or uh, indirectly through our partners in the Arizona site stewards or the other site stewards in New Mexico. Uh, so all properties receive some form of annual monitoring. Uh, the other way that we do it is what sort of you just saw. Like some of the um, conservation easements uh, can be monitored with Google Earth mm -hmm. and to see whether or not there's any indications of plans for any changes going on. And so, you know, I sort of spin through them and see what's up to at a, with, with the places on a semi-regular basis, because these days, you know, the Google or satellite imagery um, changes up quite swiftly. Yeah. Um, speaking of conservation easements, for those of us who are not quite so deep into this world as perhaps you are, um, can you clarify just a little bit more about what we mean by fee simple and conservation easement? What is that in a practical term? Sure, and I apologize for this. And in fact, in, in many ways, the terminology is a little bit new to me. Uh, it's a complicated legal world out there because, you know, in, in, in U.S. law, Canadian law, Western law in general, it's all about property rights. And uh, if we think about property rights and ownership as being kind of a bundle of sticks, one of the sticks, like, and you know, so you can think about it being mineral rights and surface rights and water rights, um, rights to access and use the property, rights to harvest off of the property. Conservation easements are the ownership of the rights to change one part of the property or another. And so Archaeology Southwest has, con has 11 conservation easements. Two of those are quite simply focused on archaeological easements that say that uh, uh, only Archaeology Southwest has the right to do any type of excavation or subsurface alteration there. And, but we would have to do it, of course, in, in keeping with the legitimate research design. The difference then between a conservation easement and um, full ownership of property rights, the way that most people think about property ownership, is uh, that um, <laughs> is that we only hold a couple of sticks in right. the bundle. Right. What effectively has happened is that the owner of a property has decided that the values, archaeological, historical, um, ecosystemic values are so important to them and their family and to their um, view of the future that nobody should be allowed to change those values, to sacrifice those values. And so they either donate or sell or make available 
uh, the, cons the, the, the a conservation easement to protect those. And so we rely on, 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 on owners and on our partners to identify places that are important and to either um, help us find the funds in order to acquire them or to donate the conservation easements to us. And we then become responsible, um, all of us, all the sort of shareholders of Archaeology Southwest become responsible for protecting those places into perpetuity. So it provides rights to tell folks you can't do that there. And it provides responsibilities to make sure that the, that, that, that the conservation interests that the owners had in it originally are, are upheld. So, so um, short way of saying it is that a conservation easement means that you can't do development there. You can't mess around with it. And that you've got a, uh, uh, an entity like Archaeology Southwest or another land trust looking out for that place. Some land trusts only do conservation easements. Some land trusts only do um, fee simple property ownership. They just have a big portfolio of lands that they own. Most of them have both. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We had a question about um, would these lands be given back to the tribes that owned them or, you know, was their traditional lands in the past at some point? And how do we work with the tribes in these areas? Uh, it would be something for discussion on an individual by individual property and tribal basis. Mm -hmm. um, one of the uh, issues that comes up right away, uh, at least in our brief experience so far, is that tribes have plenty of land uh, and issues taking care of their own real estate. And so generally speaking, tribes like the idea of having perpetual protection of places of particular importance that are monitored and safeguarded by other entities. So that's not to say that it wouldn't be something worthy of consideration if a tribe wanted to repatriate, take that piece of land back into their traditional ownership. I think it would be a good conversation to have, but we haven't been approached to my knowledge along those lines. Excellent. So the, the key as in any other relationship or engagement uh, with tribes or in any other, other uh, owner or partner, neighbor, all the rest of it is communication and having um, good relations and the open opportunities to, to, to talk about, about the future and how to harmonize that, that future with, with, with interests that involve long-term protection of places. Thank you, thank you. Um, there's a question, um, well, sort of following up with that, you know, on, on that topic is that, um, what would you say is the most impactful interaction with a tribe um, that, you know, with Archaeology Southwest? I think there's Kyle, Kyle, from Kyle Woodson, he's asking what you would think might be one of the most impactful interaction with the tribe in relation to these property acquisitions. Do you have a... Oh my gosh, that's, it's a really good question because there's so many. Um, like receiving information um, directly inherited from posterity about the value of a particular place, in my estimation, is an incredible multiplier of the importance and significance and you know value of a piece of property. To know uh, what information has been handed down for generations about a place or a landscape is really what we're all about. So that's probably the single most impactful one. And it certainly happened up and down the, the San Pedro uh, River Corridor. Uh, and we look forward to any opportunity to make that happen elsewhere. I think the other um, super impactful uh, form of interaction with tribes is to um, harness tribal values, uh, family values, cultural values, social values that are deeply linked with place in the management of that place to make decisions about what to do with properties and how to take care of them on the basis not of Western and scientific and archeological values, but on the basis of locally developed connected up with individual landscape values, call them indigenous management models or, or traditional knowledge, whatever it is, that is another example of very, very um, important and impactful interactions. 
Great, great. Um, there have been a couple questions sort of, um, can any of these places be visited? And sort of related to that, um, I, there's one viewer who's thrown out an idea about, you know, is it possible to have, as he describes it, a, a loose version of a scenic byway, drive-by tour of some of these archeology, of some of our sites or tours, you know, similar. So, you know, a few people could go. Anyway, so are any things visible or are there any plans like that in the, in the works? The um, Membrace Cultural Heritage Site, uh, the Maddox site can be visited and should be uh, mm -hmm. visited because it's such a great place. Uh, the other properties, you know, I would ask us to go back to that cost of intervention as opposed to confidence of it contributing to the long-term preservation of a place and, you know, spin the question back around and say, how do we manage and sort of conceptualize the idea of enabling visitation uh, to these sites, personal visitation, with the foreknowledge that we've already shared that we don't have a continuing presence that, you know, even Google search, you know, Google satellite imagery isn't, isn't um, you know, uh, updated daily. Um, we can't keep track of what changes might be going on at the, at the properties without um, having either neighbors letting us know, which happens sometimes, or um, going and visiting either by site stewards direct indirectly or by staff members stopping in. And so it's tricky, I guess, is the bottom line. And there's um, another question in that we would only do this um, in consultation with uh, our, our tribal colleagues, the representatives of, of, cult, of tribes with cultural affinities with places to make sure that it was acceptable from their point of view and wasn't going to, what should we say, um, degrade any further the values of the places. Um, so, you know, once you have all these multiple values in play, then it becomes pretty complicated to figure out just what to do, what kind of sign to put up, what kind of visitation to allow, um, what type of change of any sort is um, admissible and is consistent with the preservation archeology span mission. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> have there been any situations um, where we've actually faced opposition to acquiring or, or maintaining any of these easements? Um, um, have there been adversaries to any of the, the work that we've done? That would be another question, Linda, that you or Bill would have to answer. Um, I would say not that I know of, um, but if Bill, you're welcome to chime in if that's short-sighted. But my sense is that the properties are mostly fairly small. And it's mostly been um, non-controversial to mm -hmm. do that. And you're right, John, that, that we to date have not had um, you know, any negative issues. And I think one of the things about easements is that that first generation who is a donor or a seller of an easement is you know, very gung-ho about protection. Um, but when you get to a second or a third generation, um, someone with a very different set of, of uh, values might become the, the property owner. And that's one of the, I think, challenges of, of easements is maintaining that good or, uh, connection to every owner when, when the lands change ownership and making sure that uh, a new owner understands those values and the literally our legal responsibility to defend those those uh, values and that uh, we've taken on in court if necessary. So so the potential for conflict is there, but uh, thus far um, that and that's part of the reason that we actually focus on a fairly limited area. I mean, unlike the the nature excuse me the archaeological conservancy, which is nationwide. Um, that doesn't pursue, um, in general, uh, conservation easements. We've decided that in the area that we're, you know, is drivable here from Tucson and, and we can focus on uh, regular monitoring and, and communication that we're comfortable with the kinds of commitments that uh, conservation easements, um, you know, cause and, and the, pro the protection that they, they provide. 
So I will back off now and send it back to John. We're all here. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Well, um, can you uh, could you maybe address just uh, briefly if there are are there any plans to excavate or survey the properties, or have we been doing any of that work? And sort of as an aside to that, there was an, a question or a suggestion about. Do we ever inventory and protect the native and the cultural plants that are on these lands, or have we considered any of that that piece as well? Uh, those are additional excellent questions. And uh, generally speaking, there have been surveys done across most of the properties. Um, as we speak, Aaron Wright is finalizing plans to uh, produce a fuller, more systematic inventory of the first two big um, properties that Archaeology Southwest owns in the west that I showed you. Uh, the, the large parcel, the large volcanic parcel and the Gillespie Narrows um, parcel. So he'll be working to further inventory those. Um, then, in addition, we are contemplating a partnership with the Arizona um, Nature Conservancy to uh, swap their expertise in the identification and inventorying of plant resources and other biophysical values for our expertise in identifying and helping them document and understand the range of archeological and cultural heritage values that would, that would be there. And we would do that in conjunction with uh, tribal colleagues to make certain that traditional knowledge, local knowledge associated with plants and other biophysical resources, because of course it's not just plants, there's mineral resources. And sometimes there's also animals that are visiting sites and making use of them that have special importance and deserve some consideration as well. I didn't know that, that's cool. <laughs> that's exciting. Very early stages. That's exciting, great. Of the conversation. Yeah. We've got time for a couple more questions, and there's a couple sort of I can probably throw together and let you sort of address back into the lower, um, the the lower Gila. Um, one anonymous question, just asking in general about the status of the Great Bend of the Gila, but um, also whatever happened to Coil Point, and sort of related to that too is do we have any properties that are currently on our radar? And that person was asking about Post and Butte, so sort of. Whatever happened to Quail Point? Is there any odd thoughts about Post and Butte and what's the status of Great Bend in general? Yeah, so unfortunately, Quail Point's another stumper for me because it, it oh, predates no, my it predates my presence here. So congratulations on the, the <laughs> Stump the John programs going well. I thought uh, that was an easy question too. We'll, we'll yeah, like uh, it's so. Uh, to, oh, go ahead, Bill. I'll, I'll barge in again. Um, so Quail Point is a property that we actually sold the property to the um, Bureau of Land Management. It was part of their, um, one of the areas on the lower Gila that's an area of critical environmental concern. So the, the um, BLM was already um, protecting portions of, of the site and it made that a more um, holistic um, body of, of archaeological uh, extent along the, the Gila. And that is actually part of what allowed us to purchase the first of the parcels up at the Gillespie Narrow. So that those lands were reinvest, those dollars were reinvested. So um, so it's, it's all, um, sometimes there are, are um, forever purchases and uh, other times there are, you know, moving properties into other um, land managers who can um, take care of the property going forward. I like these questions because it illustrates the complex and contingent um, nature of every single real estate acquisition in every property uh, that's, perspective, that's perspective or in the past. So yeah, these portfolios of real estate are not static. And um, I won't comment on any of the many exciting prospects we have in play for 2021, but there has been a nice 
and very welcome pulse of interest in donating property or conservation easements to archaeology southwest just in the last few months and so we'll be following up on each one of those and developing those relationships the critical thing here is getting to a place of real understanding about what it is that the current owners want um, and and what and what they don't want uh, to happen with with their property and so sometimes we can help and we're just the right person and sometimes it means we need to to find another partner for them so are there um are there any opportunities for volunteers to get involved or you know what can a lay person do um to help it, it, is there anything of you know people out there can do to help move this this work along there are absolutely opportunities um uh, to assist i mean i need assistance uh, in the office with the records associated with these properties. We're in the, the process of updating and upgrading um, all of those records and creating a better um, system for managing the records and the histories uh, for all of these transactions. So if that's of interest, great. If it's a field level type of interest and you would like to be involved in uh, the, the strong possibility that uh, we'll be able to get out uh, and do some stewardship interventions in a few of these places, probably in the fall um, at this rate, um, it, because it involves, you know, what I'll call gang work, uh, taking care of some of the issues uh, of erosion and some of the other threats to a few of the properties, then I invite people to be in touch. Um, either way, either with field or um, interest in, in helping with the most more administrative stuff, I, I would welcome contacts from individuals. Great. Um, you didn't. You were going to put that slide up that showed people to where to go for further con. Can we, yeah, there. Yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, in terms of contacting us, if you go to our website, there's ways to contact us. And um, if it comes to the general email box, I will send it on to John or whoever needs to get to it. So, um, well, we've been we've been at this for about an hour. The train is coming again. We've had some comments about our train. Yes, we are half a block away from the, the train that comes through town every 20 to 40 minutes. So, um, but I, we've answered most of the questions and we'll, um, we'll send the rest of the questions to John to do some um, more thoughtful answers that we can put on the website here with the extended content. And, and we'll let everybody know who's been attending um, when the, that material is up and when the follow-up material is up. So, um, Unless John, you have any final words, I'll call Bill back. Does Bill have any final no, words? I was just gonna just just repeat the message in case it got by a few people that uh, that if you were raising your hand uh, and didn't have a chance to ask your question, um, be sure and put it into the chat now, the, the yeah. UH chat now, and I'll make sure that it gets answered um, in the in this at, at this at this address on the this URL in our website. So. Yeah. Bill, did you want to come back and one more time say goodbye to all? We'd be happy to. Um, again, just want to thank the folks that joined us tonight. And this program is one of the center pieces of Archaeology Southwest's um, preservation archaeology work. And we are striving to uh, expand it. And I saw that one of the questions that we didn't address uh, directly was the uh, status of the Great Bend of the Gila. And we are revving up for a, you know, as large a scale uh, campaign to uh, invest in the Great Bend of the Gila effort um, over the course of the, the next two years. Um, tomorrow morning, if you're part of our Southwest Archaeology Today subscription, um, there's a link to the notice that we have the new arrival of our Weiss fellow, uh, Skylar Begay, who just started yesterday. And we're planning uh, to work with Skylar in a, in a much larger team to, to uh, invest in promoting the Great Bend of the Gila National Conservation Area. So lots more coming on that. Um, and another aspect of, of preservation archaeology is the work that we do in a, as a cooperative agreement with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And that's where we're going to shift uh, a, a, month, a month from now. So Stacy Ryan um, will be leading the uh, presentation on preservation archaeology's role in 
responding to archaeological resource crimes. And our partner, uh, <clears throat> Dusty Whiting, who's a tribal, who's a law enforcement um, specialist uh, and a partner with us, will be uh, speaking with, with uh, Stacy. So Dusty's a character. Um, and he's also a very skilled um, you know, professional. And Stacy is the wonderful um, young leader of our um, cooperative agreement with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So I think it's uh, definitely worth keeping on your calendar and uh, we look forward to seeing you a month from now. We'll say, say good night. <laughs>